Okay, so let's get um, started. Good evening and uh, very welcome. Good afternoon to the sixth session of uh, the Hatha Lecture Series, which is titled um, Unsettled Performance Protection and Politics of Insecurity. Also on behalf of my colleagues, Bojana Kunz and Francesca Raimondi, who are also here tonight. And a very warm welcome to Ariela Isha Asulai. Ariela, thank you so much for having accepted this invitation and being here with us tonight. We are very honored uh, that you took the time and attention to join us in this discussion that um, actually started a couple of months ago. And um, when preparing for this lecture series, I guess your work um, came to our mind in very many different ways. Um, and I'm specifically thinking about the work that um, very often a response to political realities, civil realities in Israel and Palestine, but that brings to my mind in a much broader context, questions of how art, how a static practice, and in your work, um, very often uh, visual uh, photographic work can actually do both reinforce, but also kind of resist uh, realities and dynamics of structural inequality. Um, at stake, um, kind of dynamics enforcing people. And I think this ambivalence, this tension is something that has come back uh, in the last lectures um, in uh, several occasions. And we're very much looking forward to diving into your more recent um, work um, tonight. I would like to very briefly introduce you. There is so much to say. And at the moment, you're actually joining us from Berlin, uh, where you are a guest of the American Academy. Um, but um, next to that, you're professor of modern culture, um, media and comparative literature as, at um, Providence Brown University in the US, but also really active internationally as an arts curator, filmmaker, theorist of photography and visual culture. Um, your works have been shown very widely. I'm just remembering uh, yeah, archival curatorial projects, film projects at the HKW in Berlin, uh, Centre Pompidou, Moderna Galleria in Ljubljana, but there is a long list and the same applies to your publications. So let me just mention for everyone three books that uh, Ariella authored. So there is Potential History, Unlearning Imperialism from 2019, Civil Imagination, the Political Ontology of Photography, 2012, and the Civil Contract of Photography in 2008. Um, I guess in particular in the work on civil imagination, there is really um, the question of how aesthetic practice, how arts can um, activate relations between people, between communities differently on a civil level, other than political level. And uh, that's also a question, that question of solidarity of sharing that is implied in that, that we will maybe come back to in the discussion. So without uh, much many more words, uh, I will hand it over to you, Ariella. Thank you for being here. We will have your lecture. I would ask everyone to mute their mics. Um, so to have a bit more focus and then we, can join uh, back for the common discussion. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I am happy to be here. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation. What I'll try to do this evening is to uh, present the connection between my book that was published just before the pandemic, Potential History and Learning Imperialism, to connect it to the work that I'm doing today. So I'll say a few words about this, and then I will show you uh, three minutes from the film, The Battle of Algier. And then I will uh, share with you some of my uh, current work. So I will start. Uh, my work has long been to interrogate museums and archives and to delineate the role they play in the colonial project as well as to interact with these sites as arena of struggle and decolonization. In my most recent book, uh, Potential History and Learning Imperialism, I study the role of museums and archives in the destruction of colonized people's cultures and participate in the configuration of possible forms of restitution and repair. Yet, when I wrote this book, there were still uh, destroyed worlds that I had to attend to. 
uh, maybe the most intimate ones, the most personal ones. When I was close to finishing potential history, I felt the joy of completing uh, 10 years of exhaustive research, but was also troubled by what I came to see during the writing process, something I alluded to in the book's preface. And I will read uh, one paragraph from the book preface that I slightly uh, revised here. I would have loved to be part of an identity group. I wish I could be able to say that I belong to my community, but there is no community to which I truly belong. I own many objects and artifacts and some works of art, but none of these, even those I inherited from my uh, parents or received as gifts from family and friends were handed to me as a recognition of my belonging. I have not a thing from Algeria where my father and his ancestors were born and lived until uh, the early 60s. And I have nothing from Andalusia from where my maternal family was expelled at the end of the 15th century. The paragraph, this paragraph, which referenced the whole history of colonial dispossession, re-education, shame, pain, hope, exile, and desire, has led me to my next project, questioning the extension of French citizenship to the Jews in Algeria, just a few decades after the colonization of Algeria. And it led me to study the role of this citizenship in the destruction of uh, this world. In 1870, Arab Jews and Berber Jews who lived in Algeria for centuries were separated from the rest of the indigenous population. They were proclaimed by, the, by their colonizers to be French citizens. In exchange for this imposed citizenship, they had to give up their demands as colonized and renounced much of their pre-colonial ways of life. The objects, customs, names, beliefs, and languages to which they were attached, and in general, their modes of living, became obstacle they had to discard, thus proving to their colonizing benefactors their worthiness for the identity they had not asked for. In a generation, they had to strip themselves of many things that could identify them as other than French. What did it mean to our ancestors to shed their material, corporal, and cosmological existence? What does it mean to their descendants, like me, not to have access to the place where their ancestors lived for centuries, or not to be surrounded by their artifacts? What happened to their material and spiritual world, and to the rights, knowledge, and beliefs inscribed in these objects? Could it really be vanished? Studying the commonalities between the French colonizing powers in North Africa and the Zionist colonization of Palestine, this series of questions prompted my inquiry into the place of crafts in the physical and emotional world loss of the Arab and Berber Jews, or more comprehensively, of Muslim Jews from North Africa. Eventually, this inquiry has led me to explore the role of crafts in imagining and rehearsing for world repairing. In 1962, with the demise of the French rule in Algeria, that citizenship that the Jews uh, uh, were forced, uh, this citizenship status that the Jews were forced to inhabit, doomed these Muslim Jews to a forced departure from their homeland, but also to a double disappearance, their disappearance from North Africa, but also from the history of the French colonization of Algeria. This double disappearance has far-reaching global consequences. It turned the Jewish-Muslim world uh, unimaginable. So my own family life in Algeria and Palestine, I studied a process through which in less than a century, an offspring of an indigenous Algerian Jew and a Palestinian Jew cannot simply say, I am Algerian and I am Palestinian. More than just a personal reckoning, family history or an implied return, this inquiry interrogates the structures of colonial dispossession, 
traces uh, processes of world loss and asks, is the, this process reversible? And what kind of repair, which is often also called restitution and decolonization, is possible? Is this destroyed Muslim Jewish world in the Maghreb? Uh, sorry, in this destroyed Jewish Muslim world in the Maghreb, the majority of jewelers, those who made uh, jewels, were Jews. And in general, the majority of them were craftsmen invested in building, maintaining, and repairing the world they share with their Muslims, sisters, and brothers. Reconstructing the place of the Jews as jewelers of the Ummah, of the nation, I trace their centuries-long presence in the Maghreb, invoke the unruliness of the jewels, including that of those incredible pieces which are held in French, German, and British museums, and propose a potential history of Jewish-Muslim conviviality. While the Jews had to leave Algeria in 1962, and an imperially fabricated end was brought to this shared world, the jewels, the Jews are uh, crafted, stayed, many of which were kept close to the heart and bodies of Muslim women. Copying the forms of these objects, this is what I've started to do in the last two years, embodying the gestures of their makers, another violent aspect of what is called the emancipation of the Jews is revealed. They were encouraged, if not forced, to abandon their skills as world builders. Thus, the violent taxonomy that turned different Jews into a unified historical subject, the Jews, turned them into citizens and endowed these subjects, the Jews, uh, uh, with an imperial nation state, Israel, also linked it to a certain body of objects, what is called Judaica. At the same time, museums also invested in wings of Muslim art, thus contributing their part to the shredding of centuries of Jewish Muslim world. So a series of open letters that I write to the living and the dead, to family members and elected king, including Franz Fanon, Hannah Arendt, Hori Abu Teljah, uh, Sylvia Winter, I am asking, what could it mean to invoke the presence of Muslim Jews through the jewels they crafted? and to consider the condition of being defined by one's craft uh, as a mode of inhabiting one's place in the Ummah. Writing these letters, I spent time looking for my grandmothers, also in the vast visual archive that the French produced out of the presence, labor, and artifact of our Algerian ancestors. Colonization meant an unrestricted right to decide not only what our ancestors are allowed to or forbidden from doing in their own country, now ruled by the French, but also who they are allowed to be or forbidden from continuing to be. Thus, colonization was the imposition of identities. And with the advent of photography, these identities became French resources to be exploited. The colonizers' fantasies about who our ancestors were and what they could be were materialized in a new domain of profit and power, what I call uh, elsewhere the accumulation of uh, colonized visual wealth. Looking at these women, those images, these women that, uh, whose images are printed on postcards that circulated across the French empire, I resent the differences I notice between them and my grandmother Aisha, of whom I have only a few photos. I keep looking at these images, at the images these women are uh, uh, printed, of these women printed on these postcards, contemporaneous of my grandmother, and I cannot avoid asking with dismay, where did my grandmothers disappear? What did my female ancestors tell to each other? at the turn of the 19th century, as they became estranged types, uh, seized from their own bodies and postures, and printed, printed on postcards held in the hands of their colonizers. Did they mourn their own disappearance and their subsumption into a type, being robbed of their many distinct features, 
which they could no longer be or inhabit. Paradoxically, however, the mass production of these kinds of, uh, these kinds of postcards known as sins and types was shortly after the colonizers turned Algerian Jews uh, into French citizens. Turned into citizens, the colonizers seduced my ancestors to no longer be part of this inventory of types and instead embody Frenchness imposed on them. But at the same time, however, the invisibility that was expected from them when they were forced to pass uh, as French was too insulting for the French settlers. How do these Jews dare to be French? In the first decades after they had been proclaimed French citizens, they were blamed for being all kinds of swindlers, impersonators, tricksters, and forgers. The French settlers aimed to expose and display the truth behind uh, uh, their Frenchness. They had always seen, uh, they, they, sorry, they had always been actually in the eyes of the settlers, nothing but Jews, indigenous, and hardly distinguished from their Arabs neighbors, uh, from their Arab neighbors, thus unworthy of their French citizenship. My ancestors had to recognize themselves in the Jewish type in distinction from other types, and at the same time to fashion and perceive themselves as French and as modern, as distant as possible from this Jewish type, which they had to relegate to the past. In other words, citizenship was not only a set of rights, but an identity they had to embody, while disturbingly celebrating this double disappearance, their disappearance as Algerians and their disappearance as Jews. What the postcards actually helped uh, disappear was my ancestors' indigeneity, or in French uh, parlance, their Arabity. One of the signs of their successful inhabitation of what the French promoted as moderns was the withdrawal of the heavy jewels they used to wear whose production was a craft Jews used to practice for centuries in the Judeo-Muslim world. The disappearance of the jewels from their bodies was not a simple change in mode, but rather a disruption of a world in which craft and craft making was essential for world building and for world maintenance. And now I would like, before showing you some images from this current project, I would like to share with you three minutes from the film, The Battle of Alger, that I hope that you are familiar with, and if not, I really recommend you to watch. It's an important film uh, about the Battle of Alger that lasted you know, during two years and uh, that changed dramatically uh, uh, the possibility of envision envisioning uh, decolonization in Algeria. And there is a very famous scene in the film where there are three Algerian women that are changing themselves into French, French women or passing French women. Uh, and what I would like to pay attention to is related to the older of these three women and uh, the one who uh, has more difficulties, I would say, to pass as a French. And what we see as the last element that she is removing from her body in order to pass as a French is removing the heavy hearings that she has uh, uh, as an Algerian woman. So let me share with you uh, these three minutes. Uh, sorry, I forgot to click on the sound. Okay.
تطلع لفوق السطح وانت ريح هنا قدامي سافا مسيو سافا مليح لا اسمع ندي معايا وليدي غير ما تخافش ندبر راسي اما لا شوفي انت جوزي على البوست دبلوك تاع لاري دي ديفون من تم الخرجه راهي سهله ومن بعد الحقي خواتك الفرنسي الموريتانيا كافيتاريا في الريمشلي ملك بار في الريديزلي اسمعوا لي مليح هاد البومبات عندهم وقت اوكي ليت مي جاست ستوب ذا فيلم يا Okay, so there is a lot to say about the film, but I really wanted to point to this moment when, uh, to complete her uh, possibility to pass as a French, it's the removal of those heavy jewels, jewelers, jewels that uh, the Jews fabricated for centuries as the jewelers of the Uma. And now I would like to share with you uh, some of the images um, and hopefully it will work. Sorry. I didn't do the right thing. Sorry with the zoom, it always take, you know, another take, right? So share screen, advanced portion. Okay, I hope that now you see, okay. So, um, Aisha, why didn't you tell me that it was you looking at these postcards? Did you feel ashamed that before you were French and modern, as you appear in our family album, you were Arab and Jew, Berber and Jew, Muslim and Jew? And here what you see in this photo album that was probably ended over, you know, from one settler to another. Uh, I was lucky that it was purchased by Brown uh, uh, University where I'm working to their library. Sorry, and what you see in it is Uh, that first, uh, these two women, women were classified as Jewish type, and then someone crossed the Jewish, the Juive, and wrote Arab, Arab type. Looking at these young girls laboring for your enrichment could have been less painful if I didn't know that prior to their training, training they told you it is useless to weave a carpet if you don't hold its pattern deep in your heart. Watching our indigenous ancestors trying their best to seem French citizens was the settlers' pastime who also provided the soundtrack down with the Jews. Worlds dissected, made to fit into manageable categories. Ours was Jews, differentiated from Arabs, from Berbers, from Muslims, as if we were not also Arabs, Berbers, Muslims. It cannot be that nothing of who our Jewish ancestors were, Arabs, Berbers, Muslims, simply evaporated from my father's muscular memory, even if it did from his mind when he decided to leave Algeria. It cannot be that nothing of what our ancestors trusted in him simply disappeared when he left. Though it was in a document that I discovered my name, Aisha, it is not upon documents that I can rely if I want to gain access to what my father disavowed. Aisha cleared the path, and what seemed like nothing no longer does. Things did sneak out with my father when he left Algeria. If documents were often deceptive, museums were no remedy either. Actually, they were an exacerbation, a classifying machine, sanctioning with confidence what was Jewish and what was not. Special are wings of Islamic art devoid of Jews, institutions for Jewish life devoid of Muslims, This imperial caesura is being produced and reproduced in the objects museums collect and display. 
those with known Jewish forms like the Star of David or the Torah crowns are now ours. Fuck these ours and the expertise that continues to determine what is not ours, not us. And you will have to forgive me, I must turn off the heating. Sorry, it was too cold earlier and now it's too warm. Our ancestors did not only produce Jewish objects as if an object could be Jewish, nor did they produce objects only for Jewish clientele. Everywhere in Algeria, our presence could still be seen, intermingled with the lives of others, impressed in the precious and beautiful jewels that were for centuries crafted by Jews who formed the majority of jewelers in all of the Maghreb. Our ancestors did not aspire for or waited for colonial saviors to adorn them with carceral qua emancipated citizenship that turned them into the subjects of their own apocalypse. They had almost no choice uh, except for leaving their country as Europeans, which they have never been. The schema was horrifyingly simple. In the compartmentalized world imperialism created, and through its dichotomous logic, the Jews were in excess, deemed unfit for North Africa. First, through the conferral of their citizenship, which so colonizers claimed, would rescue them from their own people. Then through their repatriation, ha, huh, with their repatriation to a place they didn't know, Algeria could become Arab with a Berber minority. The Jews lived there for thousands of years, that they too were Arabs or Berbers, and that their mother tongue was Arabic became a past for historians to unearth. Outside of the regime of colonization, people like Paul Udell could not extract our ancestors' jewels, including their knowledge, and become collectors, art historians, and experts of our treasures. Outside of the regime of colonization, these experts could not tell us with an academic posture that if some of the names of the jewels they transcribe in their books are distorted, it is due to the Jews who, as is well known, were numerous among these who fabricated jewels in the whole Maghreb. Udell was no exception. Jean Besancenot was another with a more ambitious title in the French protectorate in Morocco. In 1947, Besancenot was nominated the iconographic manager. Did you hear that, people of the academia? iconographic manager of Morocco, of the Maghreb. He compiled yet another inventory of local jewelry, attempting to control unruliness on both sides, that of people and that of objects, who were forced to part ways. In his insulting inventory, he laments the decadence of craftsmanship, obviously denying the role of iconographic managers like him played in destroying infrastructure of local cultures in which jewelry making was not for the market, but part of social life. Part of his job description was the task of recording the authentic art, but Besançon Snow was actually in charge of drawing this line of authenticity between what was produced prior to the colonizer's arrival and what was produced after. None of these corrupted models, he wrote proudly, appear in the inventory of jewels that we, meaning Besançon, uh, have endeavored to put together. Surprised that the artisans are still there working and organized in an important corporation of jewelers, he continues to disparage their merit. The living jewelers, he adds, lost all traditional quality. They fabricate effect jewels, bijoux effet, that intend to impress, that offer maximum of surface for a minimum of weight, 
that are poor and have a barbaric allure. The colonizers who record tradition in objects disparage deviants, deny the superficial effects they create with their meticulous drawings of individual jewels, of pure floating forms detached from the bodies of their makers, as well as from those who wore them. Produced authenticity of the objects, which came at the expense of the actual living makers, is inseparable from the rationalizing obsession involved in differentiating the colonized into opposing groups, singling out one group designated as the authentic, na authentic natives and giving that group's name to the jewels themselves, Bijou Berber or Bijou Kabil. But this is not the end of the story. In the eyes of the colonizers like Beson Snow, the living Berbers failed to live up to their ancestors and I'm quoting, the Oriental Arabic contribution seems limited to very little. Bazon Snow contends, and the Jews? Though acknowledged as the makers of these objects, creation, according to, the, to French connoisseurs, is something utterly different. Hence, the Jews were totally ignored and any contribution to the creation of these jewels they were fabricating over a century was completely denied. Well, one day I decided to experiment with the craft of my ancestors. I entered a jewelry workshop and was hit by a flashback. My father was holding a soldering iron in his hand and his body was uh, leaned against one of these big wooden radio box boxes he was repairing in his little store. As a child, I was fascinated by the tongue of fire that came out of this spoon-like tool he used to solder. Uh, he used to solder the very thin electrical copper wires and to shape them into beautiful pieces of jewelry, spools, knots, and cones. My father's road to becoming a radio technician was a story he loved to tell. He was 13 or 14, and already quit school. He studied radio in correspondence and had to work in order to pay the fees. Envelopes were coming from the big city in France and in a small room on the roof, a few floors above the crowded family's home, he practiced to become a radio technician. I never thought about asking him how he could have practiced soldering without which no radio uh, could be put to work. Knowing today how ubiquitous were these small workshops of jewelry in Iran, I can imagine him reaching out to one of these jewelers, borrowing their hand torch, trading some thin copper wires and promising some short waves in exchange. I can see him telling them or telling himself that he can do more than they could, that out of these precious jewels he was learning to create, he could conjure sound. Disrupted modes of life do not simply disappear as we are being trained to believe. Don't we carry some of them in our bodies, our blood, our dreams, our nightmares, like obstinate desires? or errant pains, inherited inhibitions, forced on our ancestors, but infused in our corporal memory. The only thing my father brought with him from Algeria when he came in 1949 to destroyed Palestine, newly called Israel, was not made in Algeria, but was given to him there. It was a tin fork with an oval hole in the lower part of its handle indicating that it was part of a military utensil set. The fork, impressed with the letters US, was probably part of the US Army supply given to him sometimes between his liberation from the Bedo concentration camp and his recruitment into the Battalion of Pioneers Israelites on February 25th, 1943. He used to eat all of his lunches and diners with this fork day after day for 69 years of his adult life until he died. 
As children, the first thing we did when we prepared the table for meals was, placed, was to place our father's fork at the head of the table, near his plate. We would never ask to use his fork ourselves, nor did we dare offer it to someone else. When my father passed away, my sister took the fork. I recently asked her to take a photo of it. I felt pain when I saw rust stains at its bottoms. These stains were, not, were never there when it was in use. Today, knowing how central metal work was to the life of Jews in the Maghreb, I can say with confidence that this tin fork was his precious jewel, his amulet. Maybe this was as far as he could go toward owning a piece of Algerian metalwork of his own, an artifact that despite the stamped letters US was his Algerian amulet. Relying on their muscular memory, our ancestors crafted these incredible forms in metal long before their shapes were recorded on paper and transliterated into French by the colonizers. Some of these Jewish jewelers had small workshops. Some of them worked at home or on a street corner. Others went from village to village with their tools, receiving orders for special jewels, ones that could bring cures or chase away the evil eye. They were often asked to melt down an old jewel, to create a special form to celebrate the birth of a baby or a wedding. Their skills were not reserved for Jews alone. The jewels were not chosen from an inventory or a dictionary. They were the product of social, religious, cultural, and political interactions. When I saw this incredible breast necklace made of hundreds of coins attached to each other with a cotton thread separated from each other with two small beads strung on a thin waxed cord, I was reminded of my father's art of tying ropes. Inherited, I inherited his good hands, his audacity, intuition, and sense of improvisation. However, his art making that I learned at home had nothing to do with art as a transcendental category. It was rather entangled with maintenance, survival, and needs. We call it, we can call it a way of living with objects, keeping them in good shape, repairing them when needed, reshaping and repurposing them, since nothing has to be thrown away unless it cannot be repaired. This art making that requires carefully acquaintancing one, ones with the surrounding objects, knowing what to do when care is needed, was exactly what I was asked to forget whenever I studied art. I was actually asked to forget the world since art with an uppercase A must exist outside and independently of the world. It should transcend the daily modes of maintenance, usefulness and care. Art with a capital A as its own history, a Western one, as if the millions of objects plundered from other cultures are not what enabled it to be an object of Western heritage, and heritage to be a possession of the West. I have never seen an image of the dexterous hands of an Arab Jewish artist, but actually I grew up with the agility and skills inscribed in my father's hands, shaped and, shaped and trained in Iran, Algeria from birth until he almost reached 30. When my father died, I could not throw away the plastic transparent jar in which he amassed hundreds of coins from all over the world. One day, with a 116 millimeter drill bit, I started to pierce many of them. When I showed the necklace I was making out of them to my four-year-old granddaughter, she asked me, as if I was a jeweler, to make her a bracelet. In all the books of such treasures that I've already gathered, mostly necklaces were made of coins. My granddaughter insisted and I surrendered. The bracelet I made for her did not make any sound, neither clicking nor clucking. 
I understood that more time was needed for my ancestors to assist me in claiming my belonging to the nation of jewelers, the jewelers of the Uma. I kept stringing hundreds of drilled coins on a waxed cotton cord. Now that it is ready, the music did arrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariella, for this um, very beautiful, but also very, I think, um, yeah, concerning uh, lecture and, and material that you bring and um, for really reminding us of um, how disembodiment also has been one of the major and continues to be one of the major strategies of colonial dispossession. And um, I'm really like thinking also because you brought the question about um, how basically museums might be um, or continue to be our um, yeah, sites of classification. And I'm of course now thinking also about our institutions, arts institutions, art educational institutions, how we maybe classify knowledge, how we kind of yeah, de deprive ourselves from certain understanding of what art is uh, and so on. So many thoughts to pursue. I would like to invite everyone to join the discussion and I suggest that you give us a sign uh, in the chat so we can, um, uh, yeah, we can hand over the bird to you. And um, so let me see. Okay, I'll give you a couple of uh, moments um, um, to, uh, to wait. Ariella, my question is, um, because actually um, you work uh, across different, um, let's say, articulations in academia, but also in uh, working with archives, in museums, with institutions, and so on. And I think it's very evident how... Um, how depriving ourselves from these uh, strategies, from these skills, yeah, literally speaking, is really a way of cutting off uh, what you call belonging and so on. And I wonder, there is a question of agency, of aesthetic um, practice uh, that you bring, but there is also a question of responsibility, maybe. And I was wondering um, if you could, um, it's a pretty open question, if, uh, if you could comment on that, uh, how you see also maybe in ethical potential or ethical need in, in this research? Uh, thank you. I'm not sure that I can you know, respond mm -hmm. directly to the terms of agency and responsibility because these are not the terms with which I'm thinking. This yeah. But maybe I can you know, respond to something that is relevant to uh, in this direction. So I think that it has you know, uh, two parts the project. One of them is the understanding that you know, what was made inaccessible to me through at least two uh, colonial projects, the French colonization of Algeria on the one hand and the Zionist colonization of Palestine on the other hand, was actually assisted by a third colonizing practice, uh, which is not national uh, uh, colonization, which the colonization of art. And uh, what I'm trying to understand in this project is how uh, we were colonized by art in a certain way, in the sense that uh, uh, what I'm trying to do in this work is saying that the art of being in the world that I actually inherited from my both parents, but in this case, what I showed is in relation to my father, I had to forget it when I studied art, right? Because art as a kind of capital A, Art is about the outcome, is about the project, is about the product, is about the uh, object that should be precious and should be worthy of being you know, collected into the museum. Uh, this puts completely aside and ignore uh, uh, the social interaction of the making of the art, but not the making of the art for being collected to the museum, but the way that people are, are, are in places before they were colonized by uh, empires, but also by this notion of art, how they took care of their world. So they were different craftsmen that worked you know, as jewelers, but the rest of the population took also care of their living. So for example, when I'm thinking about you know, embroidery, this is the first you know, postcard that I shared. 
So uh, the French created several schools in which they forced, you know, young girls, mainly young girls, to uh, uh, labor for them and to labor on Europeanized models of their uh, Algerian models. So first of all, they exploited, you know, uh, uh, labor of children. Then they destroy the, the understanding that people had, what does it mean to weave your own carpet? To weave your own carpet is something that, you know, mothers uh, are, are transmitted to their children, to their girls who learned how to do it from a very early age, but it was not exploitative. It was exactly to be, to learn, uh, 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 to be part of the world. And when these girls are being trained in these schools and they are telling their professors who force them to copy uh, uh, designs of these, uh, what they call the Algerian patterns, the girls tell them, but we don't have the form in our heart. We cannot do it. But of course, obviously after a while they learn to do it and they are becoming the uh, 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 free label that the colonizers are using. So this is one side, but the other side as a scholar, for me, it's out of a question that I will study uh, 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 the importance place of jewelry in uh, our dispossession without practicing myself. What does it mean to uh, uh, be a jeweler? And what does it mean to look at these forms, not only as forms in the way that museum taught us, but to look at these forms as something that is in between people and part of a world that was, uh, 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 was destroyed. And uh, this destruction is something that I refuse to see as over. So my project tries to attach a lot of importance to craft and craft making and uh, world building. Uh, so I don't know if I replied to your question, but... Uh, Absolutely, thank you. We have two questions, one by Elena and then Boyana. Um. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I don't know, thank you. I feel really moved. I, and I think, um, so my question, I wanna share a bit of how I resonate with this in order to pose the question. Um, because I'm the descendant of Jewish immigrants to the United States who assimilated to white culture and stopped practicing and lost all, didn't even know I was Jewish until I um, researched my ancestry. Um, and a similar, I have a similar narrative with Spanish immigrant ancestors assimilating to whiteness. And one thing that I um, come up against in myself is the sense that I've been so acculturated by Western white um, modes of thinking and being that it can be, sometimes I feel that I'm a, I am an unreliable narrator in the practice of trying to reconnect with my ancestors. Like in some ways, exactly what you're speaking to about needing to practice the form in order to um, rediscover or understand it. So I, I guess I want to ask how that feels for you in your body, like what kind of somatic experience you have while witnessing these postcards, while looking at these objects, what, because it feels in a way that you're trying to practice, I don't want to, I don't know if the word indigenous is right here, but a different way of knowing, um, and yeah, I'm curious about the embodied experience of that, like how you make choices around what image is inspiring you to go further or what jewelry practice is the one that resonates with your heritage or is this, how to reconcile this almost um, imaginary space that I feel when trying to reconnect with like the Spanish Jota, for instance, or like in, in Scottish country dances where I can't actually know what my ancestors might've done, but I'm seeking some kind of resonance in the body. So I'm curious where your body, how your body responds in, in this work. Uh, thank you for your question and for bringing your experience, uh, which just, you know, uh, reassured me that uh, what I'm doing is uh, relevant to other people who didn't have necessarily my own biographical story, but it's an experience of many people who, uh, you know, were uh, displaced and dispossessed uh, uh, and their story doesn't fit into the bigger, you know, uh, narratives because there are many, uh, I think that what I'm trying to say about this double disappearance is true to many other contexts also. So to reply to your question, you know, there is no one, uh, 
there is no one way to reply to it and there is no one uh, affect and there is no one body gesture that I inhabit. There are so many. And um, so first of all, what I decided is something that, you know, is also already in potential history, something against the new, right? So I'm not interested in creating new Algerian jewelries. And I'm not even interested in becoming a jeweler, but uh, I'm interested in uh, 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 looking at these forms and copying them to make them part of my body. So I'm interested on the one hand in the recovery of my uh, uh, of body gestures that I learned at home, but I didn't recognize or I didn't acknowledge or I didn't value. Uh, and on the other hand, in body gestures that I can still steal in a way from those, you know, imperial uh, visual accounts, because they are not there and I'm stealing them because they were not meant to be there, but I'm not actually stealing them. I'm reclaiming them. I am making them uh, mine. And sometimes, you know, I feel uh, 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 really outraged when I see these images, but sometimes I feel joy. Uh, because it depends, you know, which kind of uh, dialogue I'm creating, bodily dialogue, muscular dialogue, visceral dialogue with uh, women who are being depicted in these uh, 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 postcards with the jewels. For example, the film, The Battle of Algier, which is a film that I, I teach quite a lot in many of my classes. It's a film that I am very interested in it. I think it was part of me trying to understand during many, many years, even the years that I wrote Potential History, how I can approach uh, what I was dispossessed of. So I told this film, it was also a kind of, you know, embodying many of uh, uh, the things that are going on in the film to understand where do I position myself in, uh, to understand in my body, where do I position myself in this celebration, this anti-colonial celebration, but from uh, which actually the Jews were removed because the Jews were forced to leave Algeria because of two colonial projects. So how do I uh, uh, embody this joy of decolonization, but on the other hand, make room for uh, mourning the fact that our ancestors uh, were forced to leave. So I told this film for, I think at least 10 times before I realized that the woman is taking off her hearing. And this hearing that she's taking off, because she really, she doesn't pass as a French, unlike the others. Even with all the effort, she still passes like, you know, an Algerian. Uh, but the jewel is the last, you know, uh, 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 thing that she can remove from her body in order to move a little bit to the French expectation from uh, women. Uh, so there was a moment of joy for me to realize that in this film that is already part of Algerian uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim and Arab nationalism that put aside the Berbers, that put aside the Jews for different reasons. In this film, there is still a remnant of the shared world that is undeniable. So this is for me, you know, the moments of joy realizing that I still remember my father soldering uh, when, you know, uh, I was a child, when he repaired these kind of wooden boxes, that I completely forgot about this, is for me the possibility to reclaim a world through my body that still, you know, had many memories that I never uh, access. So I don't know if I'm replying to your question, but in each and every, you know, image that I showed uh, to you, and it's only part of this very long poem, uh, in each of them, there is a body uh, engagement with uh, jewelry or with this past, and it is full of different and contradictory emotions. Thank you, Hira. Uh, Buyana, you want to continue? Thank you very much for the, for the share, for sharing this with us. Actually, you already said a lot now in the answer to Elena, and I was thinking because my, my question or maybe thought when I was really reading with you and watching uh, uh, the whole poem which you read with us um, in the presentation, I was thinking how um, how strongly this poem also unsettles uh, that what you were all the time telling also to us, like how the colonial system is the system of departmentalization, separation, you were, you were really talking about that. And then on the other level, what you were actually doing 
was exactly, I was really thinking these are these uh, ways, uh, embodied ways of uh, uh, what you also said of maintenance, survival and uh, care. And um, I was just thinking how, um, uh, how, how interesting it is that, um, um, uh, that these embodied ways or the way how to make it in a very contradictory part of the body is a way how to uh, tackle this apparatus of uh, separation with which we are all the time confronted and how these narratives are actually unsettling this separation. Uh, so it's just an observation how I was how I was listening to 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 what it was um, how the objects are through the the way of uh, uh, how the objects are in a very interesting way becoming part of the body through the stories of our ancestors and traveling through the stories of our memories and um, so it's just a thought I had when I was listening. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, let me just add that uh, uh, what I see as uh, crucial to this project is not just, you know, having access to lost memories. For me, it's a project of potential history mm -hmm. of Jewish Muslim conviviality, because what happened with these colonial projects that were assisted also by art with these, you know, the French colonization of Algeria, the British colonization of the Middle East, and the Zionist uh, uh, creation, creating a colony in Palestine. Through these, you know, our projects, uh, Jewish Muslim conviviality became unimaginable. So everything in this project is part of my commitment to make this conviviality possible again and shaping the world differently than the way that white supremacists organized it and tried to uh, uh, switch, uh, 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 to make of the Jews one uh, 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 historical subject that following World War II uh, 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 was offered the bargain of becoming part of this kind of Christian Judeo uh, invention of a tradition. So uh, this project is uh, uh, also committed from the beginning to this uh, uh, resuscitation of what was made past, which is not past. Uh, there was Francesca, I think. Um, yes, thank you very much also from uh, my side for this, um, for your talk and your discussion now, which is um, very rich. I also had wanted to go a bit in the direction of Koyan or pick it up again with this relation about things and bodies and how the interrelation between them is bringing forward, you know, this process of um, yeah, resuscitation as, as you were calling it, which is at the same time in, in your case, as you made clear, you know, this uh, a process of on learning what art did to your body, how this, you know, it teached you different gestures that now you are trying to, yeah, to overcome by, by engaging in, you know, a, a different bodily practice. So, and I was wondering how this, um, yeah, on learning that is, you know, a topic of yours, um, how you would describe it in this kind of back and forth between, body and objects and um, memories and recovering memories. So how would you describe this process? And at the same time, how you would see the, uh, where you would position the film, The Battle of Algier in this, you know, like it's a very special film as it was made uh, in, the, in, the, in the place um, and, and at the same time has this, you know, this is also part because you said you didn't see this scene with the earring very long and then at some point it, it happened. And um, so there is also a process of, yeah, seeing differently that, and that this film is in a way also a bit of an archive of things that is part of your process. And yeah, thank you. So, you know, what is really interesting about the film is that uh, there is a problem of what you know? Film expert will say the problem of continuity, because at the beginning of the scene she doesn't have the hearing, 
And when she removed the hearing, all of a sudden she has a hearing to remove, which is a problem of continuity. But I don't mention it in order, you know, to blame the director for, you know, this error. On the contrary, I see in it something very interesting. They thought about emphasizing something that is related to her uh, uh, corporal transformation. And they thought maybe if she will remove the, uh, the earring, it will be great. So they added the earring at the next scene. So I'm interested in the way that there was a deliberation about the earring. Otherwise, I wouldn't say that there was a deliberation about the, hear the hearing. So this is very interesting for me in the film. Uh, but there are many other things that, are, that interest me, uh, obviously, uh, in the film. And as you said, the film in itself is not only what it narrates, but also what it uh, contains, what it recorded, because it was done in uh, the early 60s, immediately after the liberation. And I think that one of the most important uh, things in the film is the question of collaboration. It starts with it and it ends with it. And collaboration is a crucial term in the history of colonialism because people do not collaborate. People are being forced by the condition of colonization to collaborate. So actually it's about the condition of colonization. To pass as a French is a mode of collaborating. Not necessarily when you're going to put bombs in the milk bar, but it's a part of collaborating with the regime that was imposed on you and your people but it's also a mode of survival. And the film really focuses on this question of collaboration since the very beginning. And I'm very interested in the film because of it, because citizenship that was imposed on the Jews is imposing on them the condition or the infrastructure within which they collaborated uh, uh, with the regime. But obviously they were not the only ones. So they collaborated with the regime with the several more options that were open to them. But uh, Muslims were also forced to speak French, forced to learn French culture, forced to uh, uh, trade with the French, et cetera, et cetera. So there is something about the way that colonization destroy existing worlds and impose new worlds that imposes uh, different degrees of uh, collaboration on the entire colonized population. So this is where the film interests me. And this has a different degree of bodily resistance and collaboration also in each and every act. So when I'm, for example, teaching this film, I'm teaching, you know, uh, uh, I elaborated a method that I call it a stop motion reading or stop motion uh, watching. And I really look at each and every frame in order to reconstruct how colonization is being inscribed in the body and how the colonized are revolting against the way that colonization was inscribed in the body. So unlearning is not only an intellectual project, unlearning is a corporal project as well. Um, and about things and uh, bodies or things and people, uh, I, I wrote about it, you know, in length in Potential History. This was, you know, one of the major understanding and also in the film that I did, how colonization forced us to see objects and people separately. And I think that through craft, we have the possibility to uh, uh, rehearse for the abolition of uh, several of the infra oppressive infrastructure the dominate us uh, uh, and in which or to which we have also to add, you know, the digital world in which we are being forced to live and comply with. Uh, so I see in craft really uh, um, an opportunity and craft, and I'm not saying art, because I think that art is uh, uh, many problematic uh, uh, remnants or residues or uh, uh, that should be unlearned in order for it to be part of world build building rather than museum furnishing. I hope that I replied in a way. To... Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, is there more questions? Please don't hesitate to join us. Um... I think there is a lot of things to, to obviously think about. And uh, as Boyana has been opening, I guess um, being with you in this reading of the poem also already created a kind of 
I would say visible experience of, uh, of um, yeah, of what you share with us. So maybe there's also something about, um, this is another level of co connecting to your thinking that even works through Zoom, uh, by the way, which is amazing. Um, so, um, yeah, let me see if there is. Um, Ariella, can I maybe ask, this is more like, um, uh, just out of curiosity, um, so now, um, which um, this project that you're currently working on is it? Um, I, I imagine it turns into different forms also. So, um, how can we encounter it as a film, as an archive, as a? So you know, it has different facets. This project mm -hmm. actually, and it started immediately as I finished. You know, potential history because it felt weird that I spent 10 years studying destroyed words and was unable to find the language to speak about destroyed words from where I'm coming or the dissociation that I experience to the words that I'm coming from. So it started as a project of writing letters and I'm writing letters to different people. I'm here in Berlin now, uh, the American Academy, and I spent the last month writing a very long letter, 60 pages. It's open letter, it's an open letter to Franz Fanon. Uh, so engaging with different, what I call selected kings and with family member, I write to them letters and uh, I, uh, uh, I arrive to um, have access to many things that I didn't know that I could have access through these, you know, uh, imaginative conversation with them. And with Franz Fanon, it's very important because Franz Fanon, first of all, you know, you consider him to be the big rabbi of decolonization. But on the other hand, and he was also in Algeria in the crucial years, he was a psychiatrist who ran the hospital of Blida, and he became the, a very important figure at the FLN. Uh, but there is something that he doesn't understand about the Jews in a way for me. So it's very, and he, even though, you know, his close friends and uh, uh, assistants in the psychiatric hospital were Jews, but he doesn't understand their condition in a way. So there is a very uh, important conversation with me for me to have with him. So I'm writing letters. I wrote, you know, two letters to Hannah Arendt, one letter to Sylvia Winter, to Hassan Kanafani, there is another letter that is in the writing. So this is one aspect of the project. The other one is making, copying these jewels. Uh, and uh, another one is also making a film that is related to it, which is a continuation of the undocumented. And it is uh, uh, around objects and open books through which I'm recovering, you know, these body gestures. Uh, and uh, I don't know, hopefully it will be an exhibition in uh, one or two years uh, somewhere uh, if uh, there will be the right venue that will be interested in thinking with me, what would it mean uh, to think about restitution, not as the restitution of objects, but as a world repair and as, uh, for example, just think about this, that, you know, the, this craft that uh, Jews practice in the Maghreb, all the descendants with whom I spoke, that their parents were jewelry, when they came to the Zionist colony in Palestine, they had to see, uh, stop practicing jewelry because they had to become laborers, uh, uh, daily labor. Whereas in uh, the white Zionist uh, uh, colony in Palestine, because they were Arab Jews. So we lost a craft that was not only practiced by the Jews, but was practiced in uh, uh, conviviality with Muslims. So for me, imagining this project is also imagining the condition, not only to show objects, but to revive an interest in uh, 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 the refabrication of these objects with descendants of uh, Arab Jews or Muslim Jews, as I think is the most accurate term to call them. Uh, so the project has different, you know, uh, uh, ways to unfold now, and it will be wrapped up slowly into a book, into an exhibition, into workshops, I don't know. 
I presented today one of the, you know, it's one of the first presentations. I presented it at the Tropen Museum uh, 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 in Amsterdam a few months ago uh, in a conversation with Wayne Modest and uh, today. And slowly, slowly, I'm starting to share this work on which I worked since Potential History. And we'll see. Yeah, I mean, naturally, I'm thinking um, maybe, um, yeah, performers, choreographers, um, dancers can also be your partners in that research somehow. Maybe. No? I see it's pretty intuitive. I think there was another question by Dato. Whom... Hello? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, wait. Uh, so first of all, thank you for, uh, I think, great talk. And uh, I have two questions about, uh, one was you were talking about uh, your letter to Fanon I, and uh, the fact that you, he did not, he did not quite understand Jews. And I maybe, I guess I have to read this letter 60 pages and I guess it's not easy to say it briefly, but if, if there's something you can say like what, or, because I, I kind of find him great. And, yeah. what, what exactly he did not get? And um, the second is like more like practical advice. If you can advise me some um, theoretical source about this craftsmanship or craft, craftswomanship or whatever, like uh, uh, in, 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 in comparison to art, like, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, yeah, I also think that Fanon is great. <laughs> this is why I insist that uh, what he didn't understand should be continued and challenged in a different way. It cannot just stay like this. And uh, I didn't say that he didn't understand Jews. I said that he didn't understand the condition uh, of uh, the colonization of the Jews. Because what I said at the beginning of my talk is that uh, uh, there is a double disappearance of the Jews from North Africa, because there are almost no Jews in North Africa today. But there is also the disappearance of the Jews from the history of the colonization of North Africa, because the bargain that was imposed on the Jews, the citizenship, allegedly removed them from the history of the colonization. I wrote a letter, you can find it online. One of the letters that I wrote was published. It's a letter to Benjamin Stora, who wrote a report about the colonization of Algeria that was uh, uh, commissioned by the French president. And I challenge him about the fact that the Jews disappeared, were exiled from this history of colonization just because they were made citizens. And uh, uh, I refuse to see in citizenship uh, 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 the ultimate transformation from being colonized to decolonization. And uh, I think that for Fanon, the Jews were considered to be Europeans because they were French citizens in Algeria. And he paid attention to different you know, gaps in their uh, situation, but he didn't articulate it. He took it for granted that they were French citizens. And it matters to me to uh, put it straight and to re-articulate it. And many other things that interest me in Fanon, the letter is not only about this. I'm very interested in the way that uh, 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 he approach, approaches uh, 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 is uh, um, the people who came to see him in the hospital and how did he describe their cases, what he kept inside and what he didn't keep inside and many things. So the letter is very, uh, goes in several directions. Um, and I cannot direct you to something about art and crafts for now. Hopefully you will be patient enough and you will read it in my book in a couple of <laughs> two years, I don't know. But maybe there is more, you know, uh, 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 relevant literature about this. I read a lot about crafts, but I don't remember someone who is doing uh, the decolonial work that I think is needed about this uh, connection. Thank you. I think you. we have a last question by Aline, maybe. Um. Okay. Hey. Oh, I was hoping that Aline is you. <laughs> hey, hi, Ariella. Hi, hi, good to see you. you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. I have a question uh, for you, or I wanted to talk with you about something. I was interested in hearing you talk about the form of 
flashback you're initiating, right? It's a voluntary flashback to through, and I would say flash with an E, not with an I, to reinvest in your own body. And I was very interested when you start to talk about collaboration, that is um, a mode that is being forced upon the colonized people. And I'm, I was wondering, well, first of all, your practice is of course a practice of countering that, but I'm at the moment very interested to re-narrate ways that are a form of refusal um, two modes of being colonized um, that are maybe not visible, not traceable, not readable for the colonizer's eye. I would say, for instance, as an example, it's one that came to my mind when I was um, researching that um, indigenous Muslims would rename themselves, but not forcibly give themselves French names, which what we would assume, right? Like you give yourself a French name, but a name that is still in a Muslim tradition, but sounds is more easy, easily to remain and sounds is more easy to, to, to say um, so that they can pass. So in, in this practice, I see a form of refusal that is not resisting openly because you can't, you have to, you have to um, subjectify yourself of the modes of colonization, but in a certain way, you remain yourself truthfully to a form of being an indigenous Muslim or to your, or trying to create for, for, for yourself a belonging. Um, I would say there is something that I would call dwelling in the un habitable when you are excluded from bourgeois architecture or from architect architectures that have been built, but you yourself are integrating your architecture into it. Or even the Algerian language has some examples for it. And I was curious how you would relate the practice of jewelry making to that um, by indigenous Jews, or if you have another example in your mind. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> Sorry? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you for this set of, uh, not a set of questions, but uh, uh, present, uh, ending with uh, uh, a question. So yeah, I think that, you know, uh, there are so many uh, uh, visible and invisible, legible and illegible uh, refusals in the life of the colonized. And I think that the question is not only how to encounter them like in a given repertory, but as descendants, how do we uh, uh, single them out? How do we notice them and how we continue them? And for me, uh, as a Jew, as an Algerian Jew, it became much more complicated, I think, for several years because uh, uh, we were removed from the story of uh, colonization because we, our ancestors became uh, uh, citizens. And the entire narrative is that the Jews were received, they were given citizenship, right? There is a kind of uh, 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 generosity from the colonizers and acceptance in the narrative that I still read everywhere today about the citizenship that was given to the Jews. So for me, what was very interesting is to track back from the very beginning, the refusal of the Jews to become citizens. Uh, and together, by the way, with Muslims, because in 1865, the Jews and Muslims are, are got the, uh, 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 and the possibility to apply for citizenship. Approximately 150 only among the Muslims and 150 only among the Jews applied for citizenship in uh, 1865, while they had the possibility. So what I see is uh, the vast refusal of all the others. So refusal is on many places, and I'm interested in refusals when it is individual, when it is uh, collective, when it is not legible to some, but legible to others, and when it can be renewed today or how I can refuse the entire history of Algeria and actually inhabit the positions of my ancestors who refused 
and uh, continue from there. So rather than accepting, you know, Stora that tells us that let's speak about memory because it's over colonization, I say, no, I refuse to forget what my ancestors refused to forget. So, you know, several years ago, I embraced the name Aisha of my grandmother and the, the name that was concealed from me uh, uh, by my father, only when my father passed away, he didn't tell me this name, but this name in itself is a refusal because it's a Muslim name. It's the name of one of the women of the prophet, right? So uh, the mother of Aisha who gave her her name was given a name like Marianne. So I don't want to say that there are always refusals. Her parents didn't refuse and gave, called her Marianne, which is you know, the second name of the French uh, uh, nation. Uh, but the fact that they gave her the name Marianne for me doesn't turn them into collaborators. It turns them into those who navigated their way. They didn't know how to navigate it. So I don't want to depict also only a history of heroic history of refusals. The question is how we make you know, space uh, for our ancestors in all this infrastructure of colonization that was imposed on them. And as for your question about juniors, there are many ways. For me, what matters is, for example, to understand that among the Abdel Qadir uh, nation, from 1830 till 1848, there were Jews, and some of them were jewelers. Uh, so not all the Jews welcomed the French, right? Some of them went with Abdel Qadir to create an Algerian nation. Uh, and they were jewelers. When uh, at a certain point, the French imposed uh, the regulation with the poissonnage, I don't know how you say it in English, you know, the stamp in the uh, uh, gold or uh, silver. I know, you know, uh, several Jews refused to comply and they were either arrested, either, you know, got a uh, penalty. They refused to comply with it because they uh, understood that actually what's going on is the destruction of their profession and the destruction of the way that they practice their profession in relation to the Muslim uh, 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 neighbors. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and there are on and on and on many stories, but we should meet when you are back to Berlin and continue our conversation about Algeria. Thank you. Thank you. So there is a last quick question by Bernardo, please. Um. Thank you, Sandra. Um, Aliyah Lazulai, I would just very fast ask if you could just uh, tell us why you prefer to use the term Muslim Jew rather than Arab Jew, if it's, if it's easy for you to, to frame or clarify. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I don't think that I have the right term anyhow, because, you know, to call ourselves by all these names is something that we are compelled to do because of the history of colonization. Otherwise, they were just who they were in a way. They didn't, you know, woke up in the morning and told themselves, am I an Arab Jew? Am I a Muslim Jew? But to be more concrete, why do I prefer this? Because there were also uh, uh, Berber Jews. And speaking about all the Jews in the Maghreb as Arab Jews erases the Berber Jews. And also, uh, it's not only about, you know, ethnicity. It's about, I think, that people are being shaped by the, uh, the way that they are in the world with others. And if I can think about the Jews with whom they were, or there are others, they were Muslims. So they were Jews, Jewish Muslims in a way. And the world that was destroyed is a Jewish Muslim world. So there were Arab Jews, Berber Jews, and uh, to speak about them uh, as a collective who lived uh, uh, in countries that were ruled uh, mainly by Muslims, I call them uh, Muslim Jews. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariella, uh, for uh, this wonderful lecture and this very generous discussion. I think there is a lot that is going to stay with us. And um, that was for really inviting fun. me. <laughs> oh, it's our honor, I think. Um, before saying good night, I would like to invite everyone to the um, last uh, lecture in this series, which is going to take place in two weeks on February 17 with Arkady Saides. A choreographer, artistic researcher, artist, and I hope to see many of you uh, back. So thank you again, Ariella, and have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.